primary this year, the Democratic primary for Congress. I'm Stuart Ledbetter, joined by my evening news colleagues, Alice Kang and Brian Colloran. Here in our NBC5 studios, we have State Senator Becca Ballant of Brattleboro, who serves as Senate President Pro Tem. Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray of Burlington, social worker and former congressional aide Sinead Chase Clifford of Essex, and Dr. Lewis Myers of South Burlington, a hospital physician at Rutland Regional Medical Center. Welcome all. Our rules are simple. We'll ask questions for all four candidates and may offer rebuttals. Then a round in which we'll ask a direct question to one candidate, followed by the lightning round, and then closing remarks. So if we're ready, let's begin. Brian? Here we go. Inflation is nearing 9%. Everyone is screaming about it. People want our leaders to do something to fix it. Republicans blame it all on the president and Democrats saying the government is overspending. What would you say Congress and the president can actually do to bring the prices down? Senator Ballant, we'll start with you. So I know that Vermonters are struggling. Uh, I do the shopping in my house and I know prices are up on everything. Inflation is a complicated issue to deal with, but there are three things that I would do uh, right off the bat. The first thing that I would do is make sure that we institute a windfall profits tax on fossil fuel companies. Uh, Vermonters are paying through the nose for uh, fossil fuels right now and we can be taxing those companies who are making windfall profits. We should also be making sure that we're dealing with price gouging. Um, Senator Warren has a plan to make sure that we rein in price gouging on, on products. And finally, we have to make sure that we're investing here at home in our supply chain. Part of the issue that we're dealing with here is that we don't make enough things right here in this country. So um, price gouging, dealing with fossil fuel companies and, and putting a, a cap on the amount of profits they're able to make and then investing in supply chain and making sure we're investing on building things here at home. Lieutenant Governor Gray. As Lieutenant Governor, I hear from Vermonters every single day. Vermonters who are on a fixed income, for example, and trying to stretch their Social Security as far as it'll go. And as I tour the state, I understand that Vermonters are really feeling it, not only at the pump, but in their uh, trying to afford food, basically. Um, so what are we going to do? As Vermont's Congresswoman, I would get to work to address underlying costs here in the state quickly. One, making sure that the government can negotiate prescription drug costs. Vermonters pay way too much. Two, expanding Medicare so it covers dental, vision, and hearing. Three, uh, pushing for a, a cost of living adjustment on Social Security so that it goes farther and pays for more. Four, making sure that we're investing in LIHEAP, which is uh, energy support for low-income Vermonters. I know winter is just around the corner and we need to be thinking ahead. And then finally, addressing the cost of child care in the state. Vermonters pay the highest percentage of their income in the nation. So bringing back that child care tax credit. Dr. Myers. Thank you. I, I think it's important to recognize that uh, inflation is affecting every country uh, throughout Western Europe, throughout Europe, throughout the United States, throughout Asia. Um, and it's going to be with us for a while. Uh, it's unfortunate that we got a bit behind the curve in this country. I think the uh, Federal Reserve was too slow to raise interest rates. They're doing that now and rather aggressively, and I think we can expect a recession, unfortunately, to occur, and that actually will help in its own way to stem inflation. But more positively, the things that can be done right now, and I think President Biden is moving in this direction, is to reduce tariffs, particularly on China. Many of the goods that China was sending us uh, were lower priced good, goods that we're now paying more for domestically. Um, I think the federal, the uh, supply side uh, needs, we need to improve the supply side and our transportation. And as uh, Lieutenant Governor Gray said, the child tax credit, we can reinstitute right now and that will make a huge difference. And Ms. Chase Clifford. We need to invest in the baseline resiliency of our working families. Folks need to be able to afford to live, and for far too long, before this acute inflation crisis, folks have not been able to afford to live. So that means we need to invest in wages. We need to make sure we have a livable wage that permanently adjusts to inflation. We need to invest in housing so folks don't see over 50% of their monthly income go to housing costs. And we need to invest in healthcare. We need a universal healthcare system so folks don't see thousands and thousands of dollars leave their paychecks to premiums and co-pays. We need to deliver on these perpetual campaign promises that we know are actually going to build economically resilient families because that is the basis of economically resilient communities. 
Well, let's continue um, in that vein. The UVM Health Network, the UVM hospitals, uh, say they now need to charge commercial insurance companies 20% more next year, thanks to high inflation and cost of labor. We know where that money is going to come from. Are we at a breaking point now in our health care system? What is the answer? Lieutenant Governor Gray. I think we've been at a tipping point for a while. What we know here in Vermont to talk about workforce for just a moment is that we have a demographic crisis. We have a workforce that's shrinking. Uh, right now, we're expected to have 6,000 openings just in our nursing sector uh, next year. So what do we need to do? As Vermont's Congresswoman, I've already put forward a plan to address our workforce crisis to support LPNs getting additional training, getting more Vermonters um, into the healthcare sector, two, doing everything we can to save the Affordable Care Act. We know if Republicans take back the House, it won't be Medicare for all, it'll be Medicare for none. And while I support Medicare, I am deeply practical. I know that we need to expand, as I mentioned earlier, Medicare to dental and vision and hearing, but we need to make sure the government right now can address and negotiate prescription drug costs and making sure that Vermonters across the state, not only in the UVM health network, but in clinics in Orange County, where I grew up, uh, can get the health care they need. And that begins with investing in a strong workforce. All right, Dr. Myers. Yeah, this is a, a special, especially important issue for me and one that I focused on uh, for several years, including when I ran for the state Senate in Chittenden County. Um, inflation in, in health care is real and it is extensive, but we have a problem here in Vermont, and it's a similar problem to what's happened in other regions of the country. We've allowed one medical system, one health care system, in this case the University of Vermont, to basically take over much of the health care system of the state. When that happens, when they develop monopoly power, they then raise their prices steeply, as we're seeing, charging sometimes two to three times what other independent hospitals and services provide. So I think we need to look at this nationally. Uh, I would hope that the Biden administration begin to focus some of its antitrust actions against in the healthcare system so that we can break down some of these monopolies. We can get back to supporting our independent hospitals and doctors who currently provide wonderful care and at far less cost. Ms. Chase Clifford. We are absolutely at a tipping point. And piecemeal changes is not enough. We need a universal, comprehensive, and excellent healthcare system. Because we've seen over the past decade, healthcare companies are incredibly adept at passing on costs in the form of premiums and co-pays to consumers. And consumer costs continue to rise as we see further privatization of Medicare. We see private equity snatching up healthcare practitioners. We need a universal healthcare system immediately. And when we talk about the need here, Vermont's already paying $6.5 billion into a healthcare system that doesn't work. Everyday people are paying thousands of dollars in copays and premiums out of their own pockets into a system that does not work. So when we talk about the need here, we're already paying into a system that doesn't work. We need to pay into a system that is efficient and delivers excellent care. Senator Ballant, your thoughts on healthcare reform? Yes, we are absolutely um, at a crisis point here. And as President Pro Tem of the Senate, uh, we saw the writing on the wall. We made huge investments in workforce, including supports for nurses. We have a shortage of primary care physicians. We have a shortage of counselors and psychiatrists. And that's impacting every com community across the state. And so one part of this is a workforce crisis. The other part of it is just that um, we need Medicare for all. We need to make sure that everybody is covered, not just uh, for their bodies, but also for their minds. We want to make sure that we have mental health care coverage and dental and hearing and vision. And I will just say on a personal note, you know, it's not just recently that the system is flawed. When I first um, was a mom and gave birth to my son, I had to spend weeks on the phone when I came home with him fighting with the insurance company about what they were going to cover. Nobody should have to go through that. All right, next question. Employers are really struggling to hire even as wages are up. McDonald's around the corner now offering up to $17 an hour and they can still not find enough people. So this is a problem everywhere. So what must we do as a nation to get more people into the workforce to fill the 11 million open jobs and expand the workforce in the years ahead? Dr. Myers, we'll start with you. Well, again, we're, we're probably going to be seeing an, a recession in the near future and that is actually going to um, uh, 
business are going to have to cut back. There'll be actually less jobs open because there'll be less jobs, period. That's not what we want to see, however. Uh, what we want to see is a thriving economy. And, and clearly, the biggest factor is child care. Uh, we know that millions of women and some men as well are at home now and unable to work, especially after the pandemic, because they are unable to access child, affordable child care. So I think we need to absolutely focus on child care, and that will help uh, fill some of these uh, much needed jobs. Ms. Chase Clifford. Absolutely. We need to address Vermont's housing crisis. Folks can't afford to live here. Talk to businesses from Champlain College to, to local contractors who say they extend offers to qualified folks who turn around and say, I can't afford to rent here. I can't find a house near where I need to work. And so we need to invest in our renters. We need to make sure that we're fully funding our housing choice voucher program so folks who are eligible are able to get the assistance they need. We also need to continue to push the needle on Act 250. And from a federal perspective, we need we can add plus ups for, for pro-growth communities and for communities committed to changing zoning so that they can build in Main Street corridors and build sustainable neighborhoods. And of course, there is the elephant in the room here, of course, is child care. As, as I think we'll all, we'll all mention, folks spending over 30 to 40 percent of their of their income on child care. So we need to fully fund our child care development Brock grant and make sure that every eligible child is getting the subsidies they deserve. And from there, building it out to a universal child care system. Senator Ballin. So it's true that we are in the midst of a big shakeup in the economy and the workforce, uh, the big reset, uh, excuse me, the big um, quit, as some people are calling it. Um, it means that people are leaving jobs to seek uh, their fortunes in, in other lines of work. It means we've had a lot of peeping, people moving away from the retail sector and um, they can vote with their feet. Some of the things that are impacting us. My, my colleagues have already talked about child care is a big one, but the biggest one I hear about as I travel around the state is the shortage of housing. That lots of people are able to hire folks for work at their, their companies or their organizations, and when it comes time for folks to find a place to live, they're not able to find anywhere uh, that is affordable or even close. And that is um, something I'm also hearing about among firefighters across the state. They're having to commute from farther and farther away, and that is difficult for all of us who rely on them to keep us safe. And Lieutenant Governor Gray. I'm running for Congress because I know that the challenges we face, especially around our workforce crisis, won't be solved by Vermont alone. We were so lucky to get $2.7 billion from our congressional delegation, largely through the incredible leadership of Senator Leahy, but that's just the beginning. So my focus is how do we use Congress right now and the committees of jurisdiction to make sure that we're investing in housing in the state, we've talked about that already, in childcare access, I mentioned that already, <coughs> already tonight, but also in workforce development. And what does that look like? It means expanding access to technical schools and on the job training so we can get more people into the workforce. It means free CCV. I think that's incredibly important. It means uh, free associate's degrees where it ends in uh, jobs in high demand sectors. And finally, it also means broadband. A fourth of Vermont still cannot get online geographically. And until we have broadband access for every Vermonter, we're not going to have an economy that truly thrives and is ready for a robust workforce. So those are the issues that are at the heart of my campaign and the issues that I want to focus on as your Congresswoman. Let's talk about the climate. Late last week, the Biden administration shared a plan that would allow for more offshore oil and gas drilling over the next five years. But he campaigned on a promise to end federal fossil fuel leasing for good. So the question is, how do you strike the balance of trying to lower gas and oil prices, which we all pay, while at the same time trying to save our planet from climate change? We're going to start with Ms. Chase Clifford. Well, this certainly isn't the first time or I, I believe the last time that we'll continue, continue to see uh, reneging on those campaign promises because that's what we've, we've come to know and come to expect from politicians is to run on all the great, beautiful, important things and then when the decisions get, get tough to back down from those policy choices. We can and must eliminate fossil fuel subsidies and accurately price fossil fuels. And we can do that because many of the subsidies currently in existence don't actually do anything to make oil and gas cheaper for consumers. They're solely there to line the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. 
we can do that while protecting our environment. And there's other ways that we can think about investing in renewables as well. So folks are not just waiting for a tax credit that often comes too late in folks' budget, but we can invest ahead of time and make sure that also folks have the ability in their wages and can afford housing that is climate resilient. Senator Ballant, how do we strike that balance? Well, obviously we need to first and foremost reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. We need to um, of course, and subsidies for fossil fuels, because we are paying for that, not just at the pump, we're paying for it in terms of our health and the health of our children. We also have to look at how do we incentivize people sh switching from fossil fuels to renewables? We know most Vermont families cannot afford that change. So we're gonna need a federal investment. Um, I would love to see Vermont once again be at the top of the solar industry. These are good paying jobs. These are jobs that can work uh, in, in many communities across the state, but we have to make it more possible, more affordable for Vermonters to switch. They wanna do the right thing, but they don't have that disposable income to put in solar panels and to put in fuel pumps. This is going to take a huge investment from the federal government to wean us off of fossil fuels. Lieutenant Governor Gray. I know that Vermonters are really feeling it at the pump right now. I remember just last week filling up the tank and I was like, what's it going to be today? 84, 85, $87. So I fully support the lifting of the federal uh, fuel tax, gas tax, even for the short term, although we know that's not the solution. I do support conversations here at home, here in the state uh, to lift the state tax. But this is a question of energy security, ultimately. So what can we do? One, at the federal level, if I'm on the Committee on Energy and Commerce, I'll be working to uh, end the corporate loopholes for fossil fuel companies, making sure that they're paying their fair share. Two, making sure that we reauthorize and support investments in solar and the tax credits and incentives for that right here in Vermont. And then three, doing everything we can to support Vermonters in making that trans transition. It's heat pumps, it's weatherization of our home, it's access to electric vehicles, and making sure that that's possible for every single Vermonter and American. Dr. Myers, how do we strike the balance? Well, thank you. Look, I'm gonna defend President Biden for a moment. Um, the fact is that we in Europe are essentially at war with Russia right now, and Russia has cut off gas and oil to Europe. Uh, Europeans are literally going to freeze this winter. We have got to help them if we're going to be able to push back against Russia. Uh, we also have to make sure that our own citizens are kept warm and, and have enough fuel to survive this winter as well. So I think in the short term he's doing the right thing. I think climate is incredibly complex. We are learning about it every day. Uh, it affects different regions of the world differently. So I don't think there are any simple answers. I think what is important to recognize is that the majority of Americans now at least believe that climate change is real and that humans contribute to it. I support all of the renewables, wind, solar, water, and including nuclear power, which certain countries in Europe are moving toward nuclear power, and I believe we should maintain our nuclear power as well. All right, thank you. Our next question concerns the southern border, uh, the U.S.-Mexico border. It remains a bit of a mess, showcasing uh, the nation's longstanding failure to fix its broken immigration system. Now, Texans, some of them anyway, call the situation an invasion. What is the answer? Does the Biden administration bear some responsibility for the current crisis? Senator Ballant. We have had an immigration crisis in this nation. Um, for, for many presidents now, and we have Congress who has been unwilling to act. And this is an important issue for us here in Vermont as an agricultural state. We depend on um, migrant labor just like in every other agricultural state around the nation. Our food would not get picked. We would not have food on the table if we were not supporting migrant labor um, on our farms. And so it's critical that we have a pathway to citizenship for these workers. It is um, not too much to ask that these people who are paying into our tax system, who are contributing to their communities, who are making it possible for all of us to have food on their tables, have a, leg a legitimate pathway to citizenship. And I will be um, a strong supporter of that. I am a child of an immigrant, a man who made a home here after um, needing to rebuild a life. And so this is uh, something that absolutely requires our attention. Lieutenant Governor Gray. 
I'm an international human rights lawyer by training, uh, previously served as an assistant attorney general and as a law clerk on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals where we see a number of immigration cases. I also spent a summer working at USCIS uh, right here in Vermont and understand the challenges of our immigration system. I understand them firsthand. I also know, talking to our farmers across the state, that we don't have an H-2A system that really works for our agricultural visas. We have a lot of undocumented migrant workers in the state that our farmers rely on to get their cow's milk, to get uh, food picked, uh, vegetables picked across the state. And so we absolutely need comprehensive immigration reform. And I think as a state, we've always led uh, through Senator Leahy on the Judiciary Committee. So I'm prepared to carry on that leadership. But I want to talk about something else briefly. And that is that we are welcoming refugees now to the state, and we also have to reform our refugee immigration system so that Afghan refugees arriving in the state are not going through a legal limbo, um, but are welcomed here and are ready to settle and be part of our communities. And that's something I'll champion in Congress. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Myers? Well, to answer your question, I am, uh, I'm not going to hold President Biden responsible for what's happening in the, in, on the southern border. Uh, Numerous presidents before him have struggled with this. Um, no wall or other such methods is, is going to keep people out. We just saw 46 immigrants die in the back of a tractor trailer this week. Um, people are willing to walk through the desert. They're willing to take risk of drowning. They are going to come as long as there is a pull and as long as they don't have jobs or an economy or are threatened in their own countries. Um, I believe we should have a Marshall Plan for Central America. We did this for Europe in the late 1940s and basically helped save Europe from communism. I believe we could do it in Central America. I believe we could help build their economies. Uh, we saw this happen actually back in the recession of 2008 when our economy suffered, but Mexico's was doing well. There was actually an out-migration of Mexicans back to Mexico because the better jobs were there. So I think if we create the, uh, the pull back in their own home countries, they'll want to stay. Pe most people don't want to leave their home countries. Ms. Uh, Chase Clifford. The Biden administration absolutely has a share of the blame here. The immigration policy has largely been don't come. Um, and I think they've been trying to have it both ways, ending uh, the Title 42, the Remain in Mexico policy, um, ending it to make some folks happy, but not having a plan to actually help folks meaningfully enter our country because they are coming here in the midst of extreme trauma. These folks are hurting, and we need to welcome them with the care and compassion they deserve. We need pathways to citizenship so that our communities here can thrive, and we need pathways to citizenship that are free of xenophobic bureaucracy, largely. And without that, we will continue to see folks coming into our country exploited, in danger, and being targeted by Customs and Border Enforcement, unable to speak about the inhumane working conditions are often forced to work in. So our, our, our immigration policy is, is really a racial justice issue here, an economic issue for all Vermonters, and we need those pathways to citizenship. Before we move on, show of hands, does Dr. Myers does not think a wall will work. Does anybody else have any appetite for finishing the wall? No one. All right. Alice? Next question. Here at home, a fleet of F-35 fighter jets fly during the day and sometimes at night from South Burlington, and a lot of people live close by. We continue to hear complaints about the house rattling noise and even the health impact on kids. And because sound medication will take years if it does happen at all, do you think that F-35 still belong here? And are you willing to tell residents just live with it? Lieutenant Governor Gray. I think this is a challenging issue, and I certainly feel deep, deep compassion for communities that live with the F-35s and the noise. As Vermont's Congresswoman, I will redouble our efforts to address noise mitigation. But I do believe that the F-35s who, that uh, the F-35s that came here because of Senator Sanders and Senator Leahy and Congressman Welch and Phil Scott, um, and because of the Air Force, and we should be proud that our state was chosen to host them. I deeply support our guard um, in their work. I, I travel with the guard to North Macedonia as Lieutenant Governor. The Air Guard is doing a tremendous job. Um, I think they're a source of pride for our state. And as the daughter and sister of a veteran, uh, I will be a champion for veterans issues. And I think that with the F-35s here, our biggest challenge is how do we address the noise? And that's something I'm ready to work on in Congress. 
Dr. Myers? Well, Ms. Gray just pointed out that uh, our congressmen and, and both senators supported this and helped bring this F-35s here. They did it over the objections of much of Chittenden County at the time, and I think those objections have only increased. So I don't think it's a matter of pride that, uh, th that they brought the F-35s here over the, uh, over the citizens' wishes. I think the F-35 should be moved. Um, I've heard from enough people and an, enough scientific evidence now to suggest that it would be better served elsewhere. It's an extraordinarily expensive uh, uh, project. It, it still has some bugs to be worked out. Um, and I think that uh, we could, I would like to keep the Air National Guard here, but we could actually do better if they were, for example, flying medical missions. You know, in an F-35, there are only two people on that plane. In a medical mission, there could be as many as seven to ten uh, people going airborne on each plane. So I think it would be economically just as sound to have other missions here, and uh, I support moving the F-35. Ms. Chase Clifford. Communities directly impacted have spoken loudly and over and over again that F-35s have no place in our communities. I am also very proud of the service members in my family, but I don't believe the F-35s basing here is a veterans issue. What this really is is a health issue. It's also as we talk about refugees coming and, and making a home in Vermont, it's very traumatizing to hear instruments of war throughout the day. These are also very wasteful machines. Also, we weren't told the truth entirely about the reality of the noise when, when the conversations about their basing began. So, no, they should no longer be based in, in this community. Senator Ballant. So I also support the Guard. I support um, this not just because we are um, facing a, um, a war that um, we are involved in, um, not directly, but we certainly have been giving support to uh, the Ukrainians at this time. It's a very unsettling time. I want to make sure that we have a Guard that's ready. These are good paying jobs. Um, but yes, it has been an incredibly challenging thing to have these loud planes uh, interrupting families. I know it is emotionally scarring for a lot of people in the area. And what I've been learning in the last few weeks as I've been able to dive more into this issue is that this plane has had difficulties from the very beginning. It has had safety concerns. It has had problems with the afterburners. It has been in many ways, uh, if it were a car, we'd say they, they were lemons in many ways. And so we have to make sure that whoever's going to Congress is gonna be fighting hard to make sure that our guard has a mission, but if it can accommodate um, quieter, planes that do not have this afterburner issue that is so traumatizing to the, to the area, I would be absolutely in support of pursuing that. So, Senator Ballant, you'd like to have a different airplane, you'd like to move the F-35 out. I do, at this time, if there is not another plane, I am not supportive of moving this plane to another base and exporting our, our problems to another community. This is part of being um, part of the, the, the American community. We'll take a break. Much more in tonight's congressional primary debate live from NBC5 after this.
Welcome back to the NBC5 primetime primary debate. The four Democrats vying to be Vermont's lone uh, congressperson are here, and we'll now shift to direct questions for each candidate. The first question is for you, Ms. Clifford. Uh, your principal professional credential, the one we tend to hear about most, is that you work for a member of Congress who represents the greater Boston area. Please uh, tell Vermonters why that compares favorably to the experience and skills offered by your three fellow Democrats here tonight. Sure. Well, it's interesting. I think the principal experience I talk about all the time is that I'm a social worker probably gets gets old for folks. But uh, absolutely, I mean, I saw I saw how the sausage is made. I had the opportunity to steward these great um, legislative ideas into actual text and through introduction. So I've crafted federal legislation and. I also understand that that's the subtext of, of how we legislate. I, I've seen those backroom conversations we so often talk about. I know the choices that members of Congress are often asked to make. And I've seen what it looks like when, when members both choose their values and, and choose to fall in line or, or, or make, the, make the easier decision. So I think that's experience they bring to the table that is different from others. And I think it's important for Vermonters to know that I, that I do have that direct federal experience and you know, throughout my whole life I've, I've always been a Vermonter, I've always been a Vermont voter too. So I think it's bringing my Vermont, I've always been bringing my Vermont perspective I think to all of the jobs I've held. The next question is for Dr. Myers. Uh, Dr. Myers, Vermont has never sent a woman to represent us in Congress. Isn't this the year? As you look around this field, why did you say to yourself, this is my time to run? I'm glad you asked that. Um, I want to say, as I've said before, that I understand and appreciate, really appreciate, that women, when they see other women rising to positions of leadership, there's a real sense of joy and identification. And that's true for any racial or ethnic group who sees one of their own. But I want to also say this. When I go around Vermont talking to Vermonters about what are the issues that are most important to them uh, in Rutland and other communities, uh, it, the economy, uh, guns, violence, the schools, uh, Ukraine, COVID, et cetera, uh, this issue about sending a woman to Congress doesn't really make the top five. I suspect it makes the top five among some of the media. Um, I would also say this, that gender does not define what kind of person a congressman is going to be any more than it does a physician or medical student. All we need to do is look across the river at uh, Ms. Elise Stefanik, uh, who is recruiting women into Congress but is now babbling a bunch of dangerous nonsense. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray, this question is for you. The concerns some of your colleagues in Montpelier sometimes express about you is that you're a first-term lieutenant governor who spent little time working through the nitty-gritty process of lawmaking, of finding compromise and consensus. Have you ever voted on a bill, and are these not skills that would be required in a deeply divided house? I think first things first, I'm the lieutenant governor. I'm part of the executive branch. I do preside over the Senate. I sign every bill that goes to the governor. I'm ready to step in should heaven forbid something happen to our governor, but I'm part of the executive branch. But it's important to know that uh, Montpelier isn't Washington and the State House isn't Congress. And I've worked in both. I spent a half decade working in Congress, not only for Congressman Welch, but also for the International Committee of the Red Cross. I know how Congress works. I understand the legislative process. I know how to be deeply, deeply effective. I'm also uh, a lawyer, and I know in some rooms that's not popular, but right now in Congress, I think we need good lawyers. Lawyers who are ready to uphold reproductive rights. Lawyers who are ready to codify fundamental rights that are being stripped away. And I'm the only candidate on the stage who's worked overseas, working to promote human rights, working with the International Committee of the Red Cross. We need that diversity of experience now in Congress. Senator Ballant, uh, we've also heard some Vermont Democrats worry about nominating someone who represents the, you know, the left edge of the party. Uh, I've heard Vermont AOC. Given those divisions uh, in the House and Washington's uh, toxic politics, uh, you're a progressive. Are you too far from the mainstream to represent all 625,000 Vermonters? Really appreciate the question. I just want to let Vermonters know I am a, a, the very first woman who ever served as the president pro tem in the Senate. I was elected unanimously by my peers. Republicans, Democrats, and progressives uh, voted for me to lead them. 
because they know who I am. They know I am a coalition builder. They know that I'm someone who will work with anyone who is working with me in good faith. They know that I bring my teaching skills to the work, that I'm a deep listener, that I'm someone who looks for connection and overlap and compromise. And one of my biggest heroes right now in Congress is Representative Jamie Raskin from Maryland, who has also endorsed my campaign. He's someone who is fighting hard to save this democracy. That is what drives me to this work right now. I am someone who wants to bring people together and hold this democracy together. We're going to allow all of you to answer again uh, the, the next questions we have coming up. This next one is about the Supreme Court. Uh, it has been shaped into a conservative <coughs> majority of six to three. It's led to the rollback of Roe v. Wade. Most recently, the court restricting the powers of the EPA. Justice Clarence Thomas has gone as far as written about more things he'd like to see change in this country. Should Congress respond by expanding the number of justices on the court? Let's start with Dr. Myers. Uh, I don't believe uh, we should expand the, uh, the number of justices. Look, this was uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt tried to do this in 1936 and, and uh, suffered a rather crushing defeat in that vote. Um, I think what we can change is adding term limits. Uh, to our Supreme Court justice and our federal judges, all of whom have lifetime appointments and have immense power. And I think that actually has some bipartisan support right now. I think we have to uh, remember that just simply uh, increasing the number of judges doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to be Democratic judges in the future. Um, so I think that uh, the Supreme Court has a lot of issues now, and I'm saddened by what they've done because I think they've damaged their own integrity, particularly the three judges who appeared to have uh, not just misspoke but actually lied to uh, senators uh, during their confirmation hearings. Ms. Chase Clifford. We need to pursue court reform in a serious way, and also Congress needs to do the work of legislating. It feels like so often they're passing the buck and, oh, sorry, it's the Supreme Court's fault. Oh, sorry, you need to vote harder. And, you know, speaking of my legislative experience, I worked on the Women's Health Protection Act. I worked on the EACH Act. I worked on the Labor, Health, and Human Services Appropriations Bill to remove Hyde and work to remove other riders like the Weldon Amendment and the Helms Amendment. And we saw time and time again that it just wasn't a priority for Congress. Activists and, and progressives and folks have been ringing the alarm on issues like Roe for decades. And continually, the campaign promise has been, I'm going to protect your reproductive rights. Yet here we are. So absolutely, I support things like term limits, incentives for judges to retire, maybe conversations about limiting certain jurisdiction or judicial review. But we also need a Congress that functions and that is going to legislate and, and deliver on these perpetual campaign promises. Senator Ballin. So what has been happening at the court uh, is very alarming to me um, and many of us um, across the state, not just because of uh, the decision about Roe, but as we said, the EPA and the, and the, the opinion of Justice Thomas that he's going after to other rights that um, deeply impact me as um, a, a gay woman here in Vermont. So yes, I think we need to look at court reform. I think we should be looking at uh, term limits. I think we should consider um, court expansion. I don't think it should be off the table. I think we should uh, examine deeply the number of cases that are being de decided by the so-called shadow docket, the emergency rulings that are, are put out without any real explanation for uh, legal thought. And I think we should consider uh, forcing the court to have a super majority whenever they're considering overturning precedent. The majority of the um, justices right now were seated by presidents who did not win the popular vote. So we're under minority rule right now. Let me follow up. Uh, when you say add justices, are we talking 11, 13? How many? How many no, I'm saying it sufficient? just should not be off the table. I think we should be willing to have a robust conversation both in Congress and the nation, and it should not be the third rail. We do not have to um, just decide that although there are outrageous decisions coming from the court that our hands are tied and we can't do things. So I don't know what the right number is, but I think it's time to have that conversation. L Lieutenant Governor Gray. My biggest concern when we talk about this issue is if we expand the court now, what happens with the next Congress? Or what happens if Republicans have control? And where do we stop? 
So fixing the court doesn't fix Congress, and we need Congress to work. We need Congress to work. So what does that look like? The Senate has the filibuster, and while I'll be hopefully serving in the House, uh, I would I would support abolishing the filibuster because that means we can get legislation across and through both bodies. But right now, the most urgent thing before us is doing everything we can to codify fundamental rights. It's not just access to reproductive care, it's also access to contraceptives, it's access to equal marriage. It's making sure right now we have a Congress that's ready to take further steps uh, to promote gun safety and to take on those reforms and also because of the most recent ruling on climate change, making sure that the EPA has the authority uh, through Congress to take further action on climate. And as a former assistant attorney general and a federal law clerk, I have that experience and I'll be ready to get to work immediately and put my legal training to good use. All right, next question. The country has watched in disbelief at the surge in recent gun violence. We have problems here in Vermont as well. President Biden just signed a compromise package the other day and then for the 4th of July massacre in Highland Park, Illinois. So in January, what should Congress's next step be? Ms. Chase Clifford, we'll start with you. We need to rethink how we interact with guns in our community. And I think one-off bans is not, is not going to change our reality. We need a comprehensive permit to purchase legislative approach, which is inclusive of red flag laws, inclusive of better data collection, and a permit to purchase framework that doesn't have exceptions for what type of weapon or what or, or what use you're going to use a weapon for. And, and that way we can also make sure we're requiring secure storage with purchase. And that's the approach we need to take. We need systemic reform here. There's absolutely no reason why in a state like Vermont it should be harder to go fishing than it is to buy a firearm. Senator Ballant. So I want to say first off uh, that this is not normal. We do not need to accept what's happening. Uh, watching the slaughter of our children, our neighbors, is not the price that we have to pay for freedom. And of course, there are steps that we have to take. Some of the steps that we've taken here are around red flag laws, around trying to close the Charleston loophole um, and making sure that we have uh, universal background checks. All of those things are steps that we need to take. And yes, I'm, I'm pleased that Congress finally passed something after 26 years. It's a modest proposal, but at least it signals that there is some movement. The other thing that I wanna say is, we have to name this other dark thing that's going on right now, which is why do we have so many young men who are disconnected from their communities, from their families, who are feeling such rage and such hatred? We need to make sure that we have federal funds going to schools and communities to help deal with that issue as well. Lieutenant Governor Gray. Uh, just before coming here this evening, I was reading the most recent updates on the shooting and the information that's been coming out. And I think one of the pieces that was most heartbreaking to me um, is the story of the two-year-old orphan uh, and just driving home how, uh, how this is domestic terrorism, how this, is, this impacts all of us, even here in Vermont. Right? As your lieutenant governor, I worry every single day about what's going to happen here and we can't have anything happen here. So when you ask what's Congress going to do in January, my question is what's Congress doing right now, tomorrow? Um, and I think the most urgent steps, uh, one, we know from the shooter in Highland Park that he had access to a high capacity magazine and went through two and a half of them. Um, so we need to ban access to high capacity magazines. I think we need to ban assault rifles. We don't need a semi-automatic weapon being accessible. Um, we need to expand red flag laws. We've done that here in the state, but we know that we need that federally so there's not a patchwork across uh, this country. But if we can come together against Ukraine as a nation, we can come together, uh, come together in support of Ukraine as a nation, we can come together as a country right now to protect women and children and civilians and every American life in this country from gun violence. And just a follow up on your point, uh, Lieutenant Governor, show of hands, would you vote to renew the assault weapons ban in Congress? Everybody. Okay. And Dr. Myers. Yes, uh, I think we need to be realistic. When a conservative Republican senator like John Corrin gets booed in his home state of Texas for even moving in this very small way toward gun 
rational uh, policies. Uh, very few Republicans are going to follow in his footsteps. I think we need to look at a couple of areas where we could get some bipartisan. One is banning ghost guns. They are now involved with a third of the hom uh, homicides and shootings in in our cities. And you know the NRA is not about the Constitution. The NRA is about money, and they can't make much money from ghost guns because you can print those off your computer. So I think Republicans could come. Uh, toward the Democrats in terms of banning these ghost guns. The second thing is a five-year minimum penalty for any crime committed with a gun. If Republicans continue to say it's not guns, it's bad people that commit crimes, well, let's, let's make it clear that we're not going to tolerate any gun crimes. Let's um, shift to uh, the dirty little secret, the national debt. We're $30 trillion in the hole right now. A baby born tonight in Vermont is $92,000 in debt. Is that a problem for you? And if it is, what specific idea are you willing to push your colleagues in Congress to pass to begin making the numbers stop growing? Senator Ballin. So I really appreciate the question, Stuart, and I feel like it, it comes up a lot um, when, when Democrats are, are running for office. It doesn't come up as much when Republicans are running. And there is uh, clearly a connection between the, the massive debt we have right now and the, the very big uh, tax cut that was, that was passed under um, President Trump. So the debt is certainly something we all should care about for our children and grandchildren. But there are plans right now in Congress to deal with the debt. Elizabeth Warren has, has a quite a good plan um, over you know, many years how, how to rein it back in. But a simple thing that we can do is, is bring our tax rates back in line to where they were uh, even when Ronald Reagan was president. We can increase the corporate tax rate. Um, we can also increase the taxes on wealthier Americans, the wealthiest Americans, and we uh, right now have a culture in which our lower and moderate income uh, Vermonters are paying more in taxes than many of our corporations and wealthiest individuals. Lieutenant Governor Gray. Uh, growing up here in Vermont, my folks always said, Molly, don't spend money you don't have. And I think that we need Washington to think that way. Um, we need to, to uh, align our budget with our greatest needs, certainly as we think about national spending but look for ways right now where we can save money. Where do we have wasteful and excessive spending? Uh, we know right now that our defense spending is pretty out of control and it actually isn't fully aligned with a lot of the security challenges that we face, be it uh, cybersecurity uh, internationally or climate change, which I, th which I think is one of the biggest security, uh, greatest security challenges that we face. So I would support a full review of our defense spending and modernizing it, eliminating wasteful spending and putting that towards bringing down the national debt. And then finally, making sure that we have a tax system where billionaires are paying their fair share. Uh, we don't have a fair tax system right now, and we have to address that, and that can go a long way towards addressing our national debt. Dr. Myers? What are your ideas? Well, for a long time, you know, with, with very low or almost non-existent interest rates, it was felt that the uh, you could take on debt uh, with very little cost and do many of the things that we need to do as a country. The problem with that is, you know who holds most of our debt, or the majority of it, is China. And if China ever decides to call in the debt, we are going to be in trouble. So I think this is a very pressing problem. Um, one thing we can do, along with the tax cut that uh, has been mentioned, uh, is reversing that tax cut, but is also funding the IRS. The Republicans have starved the IRS. That's why your tax reforms are months behind now, because there's no one there to work there. There's no one there to answer the phone. We need to get the IRS back to speed. We also need to help people get into good jobs, and we've already talked about that this evening. Um, how do you get people back into the workforce so that they're paying taxes? And finally, we need to reform the immigration system. Immigrants pay taxes when they come in and can work and have a path forward. And finally, Ms. Chase Clifford. Well, let's be, let's be clear here. This conversation about, about the deficit and our, and our debt doesn't stop us from going to war or staying in war for decades, doesn't stop us from bailing out big banks, doesn't stop us from passing massive tax cuts, doesn't stop us from subsidizing fossil fuels, the list goes on. So absolutely, we need to think about how efficient our spending is and actually invest in people because we know investments in education, we reap that return on investment down the line. But you know, the government's budget works fundamentally different than 
my budget and your budget works. And the way we spend public money has to be in the best interest of our entire communities. And, you know, it's frustrating when these conversations about the deficit only come up when we're talking about policy that's going to support the poorest among us. Thank you all. Uh, now to the lightning round of questions. It's going to be quick, please. One sentence only. We'll begin uh, left to right. Uh, Senator Ballant, is President Biden your first choice to be the party nominee in 24, or if not, who might you prefer? Uh, in all honesty, Stuart, I, I have not thought about it. I have not thought about it. Lieutenant Governor Gray? My first choice will be whomever can beat the Republican nominee, and especially if that's Donald Trump. Ms. Chase Clifford? No, and I look forward to a political system in, we, in which we can support more folks to run. Dr. Myers? I think President Biden is actually doing a fairly good job, um, and I think that gets lost in some of the other uh, uh, distractions. All right. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Uh, if you had to drop out of this race for some reason, who would you want Vermonters to elect instead to Congress? In other words, who's your second choice on this stage, <laughs> Senator Ballant? This is a good one. Lieutenant Governor Gray. You know, I'm not going to answer that, Stuart. That's, I love, I will say this. It has been wonderful traveling, traveling around the state and All being right. on the stage yeah. with this yeah. I think each of us has a lot more to prove to Vermonters before any of us can make a call there. Dr. Myers. I take the fifth. <laughs> uh, could you name a House Republican you could work with on day one or maybe, a, if not, a GOP senator you admire, Senator Ballant? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, right now, I think the whole nation is standing with Liz Cheney and the work that she's doing All right. on the Lieutenant January Governor 6th commission. Uh, Senator Ballin took the, took the, Senate, the member of the House um, right out of my mouth. But Ms. Chase Clifford. I, I, I'm going to have to think on it. Okay. Dr. Myers. Any of the Republican members of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Real quick, name a guilty pleasure, Senator Ballin. <laughs> Potato chips. Well, Lieutenant Governor Gray. Cherry Garcia. <laughs> Real Housewives. <laughs> really? And Dr. Meyer. It's a guilty pleasure. Oh, right. gosh. I'm, I'll take the fifth. <laughs> Again. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, given the hour, it's now time to move to your closing remarks. After a uh, draw from the hat, we uh, will begin with you, Senator Ballant. Thank you for joining tonight. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a former teacher, and I'm a state senator. And um, for most of my life, I have felt like an outsider, not just because I don't have powerful political connections, but because as a gay person, I have often felt looked down upon um, and judged. And it's one of the reasons I went into teaching middle school to make sure my students would always feel welcome and supported in my classroom. And it's why I went on to serve as a state senator to really make a difference, to make sure that our society is looking after all of us and not just the very wealthy. And we are so lucky because our congressional delegation has been the conscience of, our, of the nation. And Senator Sanders has changed the work that we're doing here. And I'm so grateful to have his support. He endorsed me earlier today, and he is joining a coalition of farmers and nurses and teachers and working people from across Vermont I hope you too will join the coalition. Please go to BeccaBallant.com to learn more about it. And I just want to say, I will work so very hard on your behalf, and it would be an honor to serve. Thank you. Ms. Chase Clifford. Well, I hope this evening that you've seen I am a candidate who is fiercely focused on policy and, and someone who cares deeply. Um, but I don't think that's what your decision is actually going to come down to because, you know, for generations, we've seen candidates say all the right things, right? I'm going to save your reproductive rights, make health care more affordable, end gun violence, and of course get big money out of politics. But not only do we have none of those things, we also have a Congress that has a net worth in the billions. So I'll be honest with you, if you're someone who benefits from more of the same, I might not be the candidate for you. But if you're someone who desperately needs our political system to work differently. If you're someone like me whose life depends on the policy choices that are often distilled into a trite campaign text, then I encourage you to think differently about the choices in front of you this evening, and I encourage you to think about me and your choice for Vermont's next member of Congress. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor Gray. 
The diversity of challenges we face in this moment require a diversity of experience from soaring costs of living uh, through a war that's raging in Ukraine to gun violence that's impacting all of us to reproductive rights being stripped away and fundamental rights to this democracy hanging by a thread. I spent nearly a half decade working in Congress for Congress and Welch for the National Committee of the Red Cross. I previously served as an assistant attorney general and have worked as a federal law clerk. I've worked overseas and I also know that right now Congress is going to have tough foreign policy decisions to make. And I've served and will continue to serve statewide as your lieutenant governor. I'll say with humility, I am a fourth generation Vermonter, born and raised on a farm in South Newberry. And as your Congresswoman, I will continue to lead with civility as I have as your Lieutenant Governor. I'll work to bridge the divide and do everything I can to bring people together to do what's right for our state. Tonight, I hope I can count on your vote and I'm asking for your support. Thank you. Finally, Dr. Myers. Thank you. And just to return to the issue of gender for just a moment, um, I hope this is an important election. I hope this election will not be earmarked for one gender or another. It's not the democratic way. It's, it's not the Vermont way. Um, I hope that the voters will think about pe people's life experience and professional experience and their views and vote on that basis. I've been a physician for nearly 30 years. And years ago, when I first started, I read a quote by Camus, the French philosopher, who said, this may be a world in which children suffer, but we can lessen the number of suffering children. And if we do not do this, if you do not do this, who will do this? That's been my North Star for 30 years. Uh, it will be, continue to be my North Star if I'm elected to Congress. It will, it will inform every vote I take. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates and thank you at home for being with us tonight. Early voting is now underway or you can cast your vote on primary day. That is August 9th. For all of us here at NBC5, good night from South Burlington.